There's no use trying to describe either Uncle Horston or his surroundings, because for one thing, a good many million years have passed. And for another, Uncle Horston wasn't on Earth, technically speaking. He was doing the equivalent of standing in the equivalent of a laboratory. He was preparing to test his time machine. Having turned on the power, Uncle Horston suddenly realized that the box was empty, which wouldn't do at all. The device needed a control, a three-dimensional solid, which would react to the conditions of another age. Otherwise, Uncle Horston couldn't tell on the machine's return where and when it had been. Whereas a solid in the box would automatically be subject to the entropy and cosmic ray bombardment of another era, and Uncle Horston could measure the changes, both qualitative and quantitative, when the machine returned. The calculators could then get to work and presently tell Uncle Horston that the box had briefly visited 1 million A.D. or 1,000 A.D. or 1 A.D. as the case may be. Not that it mattered, except to Uncle Horston, but he was childish in many respects. There was little time to waste. The box was beginning to glow and shiver. Uncle Horston stared around wildly, fled into the next glossage, and groped into a storage bin there. He came up with an armful of peculiar-looking stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of the discarded toys of his son, Snowen, which the boy had brought with him when he passed over from Earth after mastering the necessary technique. Well, Snowen needed this junk no longer. He was conditioned and had put away childish things. Besides, though Uncle Horson's wife kept the toys for sentimental reasons, the experiment was more important. Uncle Horston left the glossage and dumped the assortment into the box, slamming the cover shut before the warning signal flashed. The box went away. The manner of its departure hurt Uncle Horston's eyes. He waited. And he waited. Eventually, he gave up and built another time machine with identical results. Snowen hadn't been annoyed by the loss of his old toys, nor had Snowen's mother, so Uncle Horston cleaned out the bin and dumped the remainder of his son's childhood relics in the second time machine's box. According to his calculations, this one should have appeared on Earth in the latter part of the 19th century A.D. If that actually occurred, the device remained there. Disgusted, Uncle Horston decided to make no more time machines, but the mischief had been done. There were two of them, and the first... Scott Paradigm found it while he was playing hooky from the Glendale Grammar School. There was a geography test that day, and Scott saw no sense in memorizing place names, which in the 19th century was a fairly sensible theory. Besides, it was the sort of warm spring day with a touch of coolness in the breeze which invited a boy to lie down in the field and stare at the occasional clouds till he fell asleep. Nuts to geography, Scott dozed. About noon, he got hungry, so his stocky legs carried him to a nearby store. There, he invested his small hoard with penurious care and with a sublime disregard for his gastric juices. He went down by the creek to feed. Having finished a supply of cheese, chocolate, and cookies, and having drained the soda pop bottle to its dregs, Scott caught tadpoles and studied them with a certain amount of scientific curiosity. He did not persevere. Something tumbled down the bank and thudded into the muddy ground near the water, so Scott, with a wary glance around, hurried to investigate. It was a box. It was, in fact, the box. The gadgetry hitched to it meant little to Scott, though he pondered why it was so fused and burned. He pondered. With his jackknife, he pried and probed, his tongue sticking out from the corner of his mouth. Hmm. Nobody was around. Where did the box come from? Somebody must have left it here, and sliding soil had dislodged it from its precarious perch. That's a helix, Scott decided quite erroneously. It was helical, but it wasn't a helix because of the dimensional warp involved. Had the thing been a model airplane, no matter how complicated, it would have held few mysteries to Scott. As it was, a problem was posed. Something told Scott that the device was a lot more complicated than the spring motor he had deftly dismantled last Friday. But no boy has ever left a box unopened unless forcibly dragged away. Scott probed deeper. The angles on this thing were funny, short circuit probably. That was what... Aha! The knife slipped. Scott sucked his thumb and gave vent to experienced blasphemy. Maybe it was a music box. Scott shouldn't have felt depressed. The gadgetry would have given Einstein a headache and driven Steinmetz raving mad. The trouble was, of course, that the box had not yet completely entered the space-time continuum where Scott existed, and therefore it could not be opened. At any rate, not till Scott used a convenient rock to hammer the helical non-helix into a more convenient position. He hammered it, in fact, from its contact point with the fourth dimension, releasing the space-time torsion it had been maintaining. There was a brittle snap. 
The box jarred slightly and lay motionless, no longer only partially in existence. Scott opened it easily now. The soft, woven helmet was the first thing that caught his eye, but he discarded that without much interest. It was just a cap. Next, he lifted a square, transparent crystal block, small enough to cup in his palm, much too small to contain the maze of apparatus within it. In a moment, Scott had solved that problem. The crystal was a sort of magnifying glass, vastly enlarging the things inside the block. Strange things they were, too. Miniature people, for example. They moved, like clockwork automatons, though much more smoothly. It was rather like watching a play. Scott was interested in their costumes, but fascinated by their actions. The tiny people were deftly building a house. Scott wished it would catch fire so he could see the people put it out. Flames licked up from the half-completed structure. The automatons, with a great deal of odd apparatus, extinguished the blaze. It didn't take Scott long to catch on. But he was a little worried. The mannequins would obey his thoughts. By the time he discovered that, he was frightened and threw the cube away from him. Halfway up the bank, he reconsidered and returned. The crystal lay partly in the water, shining in the sun. It was a toy. Scott sensed that with the unerring instinct of a child, but he didn't pick it up immediately. Instead, he returned to the box and investigated its remaining contents. He found some really remarkable gadgets. The afternoon passed all too quickly. Scott finally put the toys back in the box and lugged it home, grunting and puffing. He was quite red-faced by the time he arrived at the kitchen door. His find he hid at the back of a closet in his room upstairs. The crystal cube he slipped into his pocket, which already bulged with string, a coil of wire, two pennies, a wad of tinfoil, a grimy defense stamp, and a chunk of feldspar. Emma, Scott's two-year-old sister, waddled unsteadily in from the hall and said hello. Hello, slug. Scott nodded from his altitude of seven years and some months. He patronized Emma shockingly, but she didn't know the difference. Small, plump, and wide-eyed, she flopped down on the carpet and stared dolefully at her shoes. Tie him, Scotty, tie him, please. Sap, Scott told her kindly, but not at the laces. Dinner ready yet? Emma nodded. Let's see your hands. For a wonder, they were reasonably clean, though probably not aseptic. Scott regarded his own paws thoughtfully and, grimacing, went to the bathroom where he made a sketchy toilet. The tadpoles had left traces. Dennis Paradine and his wife, Jane, were having a cocktail before dinner downstairs in the living room. He was a youngish, middle-aged man with soft gray hair and a thin, prim-mouthed face. He taught philosophy at the university. Jane was small, neat, dark, and very pretty. She sipped her martini and said, New shoes? Like them. Here's to crime, Paradine muttered absently. Hmm, shoes? Not now. Wait till I finish this. I've had a bad day. Exams? Yeah. Flaming youth aspiring towards manhood. I hope they died. In considerable agony. Inshallah. I want the olive, Jane requested. I know, Paradine said despondently. It's been years since I've tasted one myself. In a martini, I mean. Even if I put six of them in your glass, you're still not satisfied. I want yours. Blood brotherhood. Symbolism. That's why. Paradine regarded his wife balefully and crossed his long legs. You sound like one of my students. Like that hussy Betty Dawson, perhaps? Jane unsheathed her nails. Does she still leer at you in that offensive way? She does. The child is a neat psychological problem. Luckily, she isn't mine. If she were, Paradine nodded significantly. Sex consciousness and too many movies. I suppose she still thinks she can get a passing grade by showing me her knees, which are, by the way, rather bony. Jane adjusted her skirt with an air of complacent pride. Paradine uncoiled himself and poured fresh martinis. Candidly, I don't see the point of teaching those apes philosophy. They're all at the wrong age. Their habit patterns, their methods of thinking are already laid down. They're horribly conservative, not that they admit it. The only people who can understand philosophy are mature adults or kids like Emma and Scotty. Well, don't enroll Scotty in your course, Jane requested. He isn't ready to be a philosophy doctor. I hold no brief for a child genius, especially when it's my son. Scotty would probably be better at it than Betty Dawson, Paradine grunted. He died an enfeebled old dotard at five, Jane quoted grimly. I want your olive. Here. Uh, by the way, I like the shoes. Thank you. Here's Rosalie. Dinner? It's all right, Miss Paradine, said Rosalie, hovering. I'll call Miss Emma and Mr. Scotty. I'll get them. Paradine put his head into the next room and roared, Kids, come and get it. Small feet scuttered down the stairs. Scott dashed into view, scrubbed and shining, a rebellious cowlick aimed at the zenith. 
Emma pursued, levering herself carefully down the steps. Halfway, she gave up the attempt to descend upright and reversed, finishing the task, monkey fashion, her small behind giving an impression of marvelous diligence upon the work in hand. Paradigm watched fascinated by the spectacle till he was hurled back by the impact of a son's body. Hi, Dad! Scott shrieked. Paradigm recovered himself and regarded Scott with dignity. Hi, yourself. Help me into dinner. You've dislocated at least one of my hip joints. But Scott was already tearing into the next room where he stepped on Jane's new shoes in an ecstasy of affection, burbled an apology, and rushed off to find his place at the dinner table. Paradigm cocked up an eyebrow as he followed, Emma's pudgy hand desperately gripping onto his forefinger. Wonder what the young devil's been up to. No good, probably, Jane sighed. Hello, darling. Let's see your ears. They're clean. Mickey licked them. Well, that Airedale's tongue is far cleaner than your ears, Jane pondered, making a brief examination.